I'm really passionate about something, then I'm gonna do whatever it takes to make it happen. This is Leslie Patterson. Leslie Patterson. Leslie Patterson. Leslie Patterson. She's one of the writers and executive producers of the award-winning Netflix film, All Quiet on the Western Front. And when I say award-winning, I'm talking eight Lolas, seven BAFTAs, four Oscars. But getting this film made was anything but easy. And All Quiet was a challenging experience. And as a no-name writer, nobody's going to pick up your calls. Nobody gives a shit. When we optioned the material, you're not thinking it's going to take you 16 years. Finance came on and off, producers came on and off, cast came on and off, directors came on and off. And in all that time, though, you invested like a quarter million dollars of your own money just to try and make this happen, right? You rationalize it in your brain. You say, okay, yes, this is a lot of money that we don't necessarily have, but it's like any kind of startup. I was selling all of my bikes. We had to sell everything in our house to just pay our bills. And then all of a sudden, Netflix greenlit it, and I f***ing went for it. I have to say, you're the very first guest I've ever had on where if I Google your name, two things come up. One, a whole bunch of Academy Award nominations for a film, and number two, a video called How to Not F*** Yourself. What, does that pretty much describe <laughs> the two areas of your life? Yeah, pretty much. That's absolutely perfect. Anybody that knows me, uh, certainly as an athlete, um, knows that I tend to run into the bushes rather a lot. So, uh, yeah, I've got a pretty funny story about that, actually. Though, you know, my dad is kind of the same and I grew up doing sport with him from a very young age, right? I was like running over the hills of Scotland with my old man and uh, he was notorious for having a stop for the toilet, you know, just anywhere. So I think I've picked it up off him. Um, but uh, but yeah, I have uh, lost my way a couple of times, shall we say. I was doing a race uh, uh, this one year and it was a cross-country race and I had a choice. It was either shit myself and win the race or stop and go to the bathroom. So um, I won the race. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that's the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I ran through the finish line. And my husband's like, why is she keeping on going? And then he looked at my back and he thought, gosh, I don't remember the course being that muddy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, anyway, I made a beeline to the toilet and was promptly in there for about 15 minutes and almost missed the medal ceremony. So there we go. But you won. But I won. <laughs> and that's the story of my life, right? What do you have to sacrifice to get to the top? <laughs> oh, I like that. We're going to get into that. Um I don't know if we're just supposed to just share these types of stories or not, but um, I only started getting healthy a few years ago. Um, and so I've never really been a runner, but I like running. And uh, you know, you know, like konjac noodles, you yes. know, the, oh, you know, they're I like didn't. very fibrous. And, <laughs> and they come um, out looking like how they did when they went in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was out one morning, like really early, like four, four thirty in the morning, um, out for a run in my neighborhood. But I was like, a, I don't know, three kilometers away from home. And at 4.30 in the morning, there's nothing open. And I'm in like the suburbs. Uh, and my stomach just starts to... Because I ate way too many konjac noodles the day before. So I uh, had to be a bit like you, I think. And in <laughs> in the suburbs, <laughs> outside of an LA fitness, I had to find some shrubbery to, uh, to go hide behind. I've never said that to anyone other than my wife and my personal trainer. They thought both thought that was ridiculous. Uh, but hey, if, listen, when it needs to come out, it needs to come out. And if you know, if you're part of the running community, you know that. So there's a certain amount of respect. It's like you're not a true runner until you've done it in the bushes, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, listener, if you're still with us at this point in the conversation, I think this gives a sense of what's about to come. So, uh, I want to get into um, the mindset that you've developed as an athlete because. <laughs> When I worked through all of your press junkets and all of your interviews, everyone, including myself, gets caught up on the same thing. Like you were on a panel of screenwriters uh, for, I think it was like the Santa Barbara Film Festival or something. Yeah. And there's like screenwriter and there's screenwriter and there's playwright and there's novelist. And then everyone's like, and then there's professional athlete you. <laughs> and so <laughs> everyone is so caught up on this like, okay, I picture you in one box right? You are like this powerhouse triathlete. Yeah. Um, and I want to get to how you transition to being uh, in film and in Hollywood and go to school and all that stuff. But but let, let's just start at the obvious question. How are these two things connected? Like they're totally opposite if you just ignore mindset, of course. 
Do you know, it's funny because, yeah, I think throughout my life, people have always said, if you want to be the best at anything, you have to focus on one thing. And that's never worked for me. And curiously, I think creativity, there's a blending of creativity and science in every single aspect of life. And, you know, I've been an artist and an athlete my whole life. So even at a young age, right, my first sport was rugby. That's what I first jumped into. Um, I was in, you know, the only girl on an all boys team, right? 250 guys and me, loved it, covered in mud, beating up on the boys, like real primal stuff. But then I also had a really artistic side. And in the morning I would do rugby and in the afternoon I would do ballet. And of course I'd rock up to my ballet dancing and I'd be still have muddy knees, odd socks, hair all over the place. So I didn't fit in, but I just loved this sort of kinesthetic um, connection to my body and the expression of it. And I then went on to do quite a lot of uh, contemporary dance and perform in a group. And my sister actually uh, was a professional contemporary dancer. So like I've always had those two different things that have melded. So I think one has actually helped the other massively. So as an athlete, I think I really, certainly in my initial career, I really got caught up in the science of everything. And I was put down this path right, of uh, being in the national team, going for the Olympics. Everything was about science. This was in the sort of late 90s and testing and lab work. And I was getting lottery funding in the UK, but you had to reach certain numbers. And I'm a very emotional person. I'm driven by heart, you know, like Braveheart's my favorite film. You know what I mean? So it's like... There's a reason it, why your coaching company is called Braveheart then, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. And our production company is now called Brave Art Entertainment. There you go. Um, but, uh, but, you know, here I was kind of trying to pursue something and being forced down this avenue and the testing results and the lab results were not that great. And they were saying I wasn't good enough, but I knew I had all this, what my husband calls piss and vinegar inside of me. And so get me on a start line, duking it out, all of a sudden this whole aspect of my performance comes out. So, you know, that was like a really sharp learning curve. So I was trying to be funneled. I was told there's only one way to, to get to the top and you don't fit it. And I believe that because, hey, listen, I'm only 16, 17 years old. I've grown up in a small town in Scotland. I'm not necessarily thinking blue sky. But then I got the opportunity to move to... Um, to California with my husband, which is a completely different mindset. And I went back to study my master's degree in theatre and acting and basically tried to find passion for life again, tried to discover myself through art. And that allowed me to find a different type of triathlon to approach sport in a different way with a different kind of attitude. Like, this is my personality. How do I best take this sort of physiology, like what I understand about principles of training and then have it suit who I am from an emotional perspective? That takes creativity to understand how to kind of put all those pieces together. And that's what got me to the top in sport. So it's like, it's always been this, kind of marrying and mixing of the two elements of these parts of my life. And when your path forward was prescribed for you, because you're so young and you're like, this is the way forward. And you almost have to, I think we've all done that, whether it's a professional career or in marriage or relationships, you just have to take what people tell you at, I mean, they know and you don't. Um, and the real breakthrough is when you're like, oh, that's bullshit. Uh, there's always a, a different path or a different way forward. But right. But what at what point kind of in your career was that unlock for you and that real aha moment? What happened around that? Um, I would have said it was understanding how important being passionate is about the thing that I'm doing. Uh, my husband calls me like one of those wind-up dolls, right? Uh, you wind me up and you point me in the right direction, go, you know? And if I don't have a direction, I'm fucked. So... I think when I was pursuing this avenue of triathlon in my early life in this specific way, it was taking me down a path that like, I actually wasn't that passionate about, but that's the path I thought I had to take. So it's like you then don't have the passion to drive you to master your craft. So then coming out to California, I think, and doing this master's degree, I'd gone from, oh my God, I'm never going to be passionate about anything again. I never want to do another triathlon. I always thought I was going to be an athlete. Now I'm not. 
to, oh my God, I absolutely love this. Like I just have so much joy about discovery and I was taking acting to the camera classes and I was like doing cheesy horror films and like, you know, collaborating with all these people and deeply thinking about aspects of life and the theory of art and storytelling and all of a sudden something was switched on in me and it was, that was the aha moment that like, if I'm really passionate about something, then I'm going to do whatever it takes to make it happen. Cause that's my personality. I'm so driven. So then it kind of opened the door up to, well, maybe there's other sports that, 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 could connect the way I thought they, you know, were supposed to. And that's when Xterra, which is off-road triathlon, came into the picture. And that is swimming, mountain biking, and trail running. And that, to me, reached out to my soul because I grew up in the mud playing rugby. I grew up running over the hills and mountains of Scotland. I love scenery. I love trails. I'm very good at climbing and hills and all that kind of stuff. So it kind of played into all of the best parts of me. And then also it excited my soul. So those two things kind of collided. And and, and that was that, you know, off I was, I was on this other journey. <laughs> so if when you were young, your goal was set on sports and athletics for the Olympics and for the training and for the right way, I mean, that's a very high bar and that's a very high goal. And then you get into triathlon and then you find Xterra, which is this other version of it. I think a skeptic or an outsider would say, didn't you just continue to shrink down your goal until you could kind of win it? Or do you not see it that way? I think I see it more about why I'm doing what I'm doing, what excites me about whatever it is I'm doing. And um, in the Olympics, the form of triathlon that exists or, or is part of the Olympics, it's a very specific type of triathlon. And it's kind of complicated unless you're a triathlete, but essentially you're allowed to draft on the bike which means like in the Tour de France, you know, there's groups of athletes, which means ultimately you have to be a very good swimmer to get out the water, to then be on the bike and be in the front pack to be able to run well and win the race. Furthermore, the style of racing was very much about city centres. So it was all about spectators, television money, driven by money, of course. Uh, and so it was multiple circuits in an inner city. Well, that's not why I started the sport. So not only was I not good enough of a swimmer, I mean, still a pretty solid swimmer, but just not good enough. You know, you're two minutes down, you're fucked. So I, I tried to be and I just wasn't. So then what next? You know, not only do you not enjoy that form of sport, but then there's this other form of sport that like, oh my God, I'm traveling the world. I'm like seeing all these different trails and beautiful landscapes and the community is so much more fun. And, you know, that's again, and it's the same, right? Like people could turn to me and say, in terms of film, oh, well, are you just going to go for the big paychecks or, you know, the comic book or the Marvel, if you were offered that, like, I would rather choose the harder route that I'm passionate about. Now, if I'm passionate about Marvel movies, awesome, but I know I'm not. I want to make films that say something and that mean something. So if that means a lesser paycheck or it's not going to be seen in the movies or whatever that means, I'm staying, it's about staying true to what I'm passionate about. I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, and in between you, you leaving kind of the traditional sport and you finding the new way to approach it, you know, you said you went to film school and what have you, but how did you handle kind of that identity shift? I've often struggled with the, if I'm not this, then what am I? Now, if you're off, like, if I'm off to the next exciting thing right away, I don't have to worry about that. But sometimes we have to sit in this gap of like winding something up before the next thing comes along. How do you handle those transitions? Uh, when I was younger, very hard, you know, losing my identity as an athlete. So I basically didn't qualify for the Commonwealth Games in um, 20, 2002. And, but I was lucky enough that I just met my husband, a wonderful guy that I write and produce with. And he had gotten a job out in California. So really, I was very lucky. I got to shed that old skin. and come He's, he's a sports psychologist, right? He's, yeah, or behavioral psychologist. Uh, so he was in a medical school um, in San Diego, California. But it was like, okay, you're moving to a new country. You're embarking on a master's degree in a completely different area. Like nobody knows who you are as an athlete. You can kind of shed that skin. I was lucky in that regard, right? So I think it's just understanding the strategies to help 
sort of not feel like you've lost an identity and more about, you know, what else am I interested in in the world? And let's open up those doors. So less about failure and more about where am I now going? What am I excited about? And so along the way, obviously, many years go by. Um, what I found most interesting is I started to dig into All Quiet on the Western Front, which is the film, the Netflix film that has won, I don't know, six or seven BAFTAs and I think four Academy Awards. Uh, and uh, I, what I was surprised by was one, that it took you guys 16 years in pre-production of optioning the film and writing it. So, so you are the executive producer. You are one of the writers uh, credited on the film. That you spent 16 years is um is like okay determination and i guess if it took you 20 or 30 you guys would have kept going but i mean the fact that you had to invest two hundred thousand dollars of your own money into just keeping this project alive year after year where you know it, it took you 16 years to get it out i mean that's massive i know it's funny because people always see it's crazy and i guess at the time you rationalize it. And maybe that's skills that I've developed through sport, right? Like you segment a triathlon, you segment your training. You're never thinking, oh my God, I've got seven hours of training a day. You're taking it bit by bit, right? So my brain has been rewired in many ways to handle that. Um, and then you look at the big picture. So, I mean, when we optioned the material, you're not thinking it's going to take you 16 years. Um, you're optioning the material, the book in this instance, because... You love it. You love what it has to say. You have a special take in it in terms of its adaptation. And you have an idea of how to maybe get it done. But also you see it's an opportunity. And intellectual properties, we well know now, not so much maybe 16 years ago, but it sets you apart from everyone else. And as a no-name writer, nobody's going to pick up your calls. Nobody gives a shit. How do you get your career off the ground? How do you know make it really sort of jump? And we always believe that having an IP of this kind of size could do that. And we just we kind of went for it, you know. Um, we had a take. We pitched the estate of the author. They said yes. And we created good relationships with them. This business is all relational. And um, we had to convince them every year that, yes, we're still your guys to do it. And yes, we can still get it done. Um, you know, finance came on and off. Producers came on and off. Cast came on and off. Directors came on and off. But for us, it was like rationalizing it. One, again, passion. We were so passionate about how we had decided to tell the story that this was a great take and what it had to say that we wanted to keep doing it secondly you again you rationalize it in your brain you say okay yes this is a lot of money that we don't necessarily have and certainly years we definitely didn't have it and we had to beg borrow and steal but it's like any kind of startup you see it as an investment in your business and it opened doors along the way what we were learning it was like film school learning how to put a film like this together so you know you're educating yourself so just imagine that you're paying you know 10 grand a year for your schooling you know you so you rationalize it in your head like that it's not just like some whim um and it did do that the amount of people that we met along the way was just crazy um, and obviously now it's paid off more than we <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it's kind of worked out <laughs> yeah but it's but what I always find most interesting is that with your amount of determination and your amount of patience and there is the carrying cost of course um, if we weren't if, if it wasn't you know shot during COVID and released in 22 and we weren't talking in 23 then maybe it'd be 25 or 27 or 28 like eventually the market might come and you might continue to tweak it it might have taken you 30 years. And then in which case we'd be talking 30 years later and you'd say, yeah, I gave 30 years to this. Of course, I didn't think it would take 30 years. But the fact that you almost never give up on it means that success is much more likely. Do you know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. And I think it's, again, like you've spoken about mindset, but it totally is just like a mindset. When I'm, you know, when I have something... When I have the bit between my teeth, it's like I'm never letting go. And people would say, I mean, everybody told us, what are you still doing? Give it up. Why are you still doing this? And then you just get to that point, you're like, fuck you. You know, like, you know, and, and people say the same about my training. You know, I'm not competing anymore at that level. Uh, maybe I'll jump into a race. Maybe I won't. Everyone wants to put it in a box, you know, like, oh, are you retired then? I'm like, well, I still raced last year and got fourth at the Worlds. Um, I don't know. Maybe not. Probably not. I mean, our focus is on film, but what does it matter? You know, and it's the same with this, right? It's like, you just keep doing it. You know, training for me, for example, is like brushing my teeth. 
you know, hanging on to a project and seeing it through if you're super passionate about it. That's just like, it's just what I do. I don't know any different. So you started this whole process, what, in 2006, 2005? When did the whole thing kick off? I think it was 2006. Okay. Yeah. And so at that point in your career, um, you're, you're finishing film school, whatever. Was the idea behind this like, you will become a, a film producer? Like this is your next chapter in your career? Yeah. So at the time I was working with Ian Stokel, the other accredited writer on the project, and we were good mates and we were starting to write together because I was acting at the time and he had said to me, listen, you know, if you want to act, you really need to write and produce your own stuff. So you have some kind of like autonomy over the Ben something. Affleck approach, right? <laughs> exactly. And I was like, well, you know, that's kind of a good idea. And I promptly find out that one, I was not very good at acting, but two, I actually enjoyed the sort of collaboration, the creation of story. I was actually trained in it and I didn't realize it sort of a thing through all of my studies. And um, from a producing standpoint, you know, I'm a very relational driven person. My whole athletic career has been about that. My family life, my all of my friends, it's all about helping other people, them helping you, creating communities. And that's ultimately what producing is about as well. So it's like, yeah, it just felt right. So I actually did produce a feature film way back then. Um, and we produced it for 10,000 bucks. And it was a feature film shot in seven days with 27 locations. Oh, you shot a feature. <laughs> I went uh, to film school <laughs> and, oh, okay. and actually became a producer and stuff. You shot a feature so, for, for $10,000. That is beyond yeah. low budget. Oh, it's beyond low budget. Totally. And it was like... Because, a bunch because of- um, the Blair Witch Project w- was shot for $32,000 in the 90s. <laughs> oh, I- I know. I mean, this was like retro style, but this was seriously like using every connection that I had in San Diego through my sports life. Um, You know, I was uh, literally like, for example, we didn't spend any money on catering because I went out to every friend that I knew. And I knew a lot of friends in the restaurant business and they all each restaurant provided a meal, you know, and we had a bunch of film any good. Do you know what? It was actually really fun. I mean, the sound, okay. sound was not great. So the concept was a mockumentary. Um, and the concept was, it's about, uh, uh, it, it's called Something Blue. And it's about um, a, another, a, a race of blue people from Antarctica um, called Polar Americans. And it's about an interglacial marriage between white and blue people. And it's shot in the style of a mockumentary. I've got the funniest bloody stories about this. I'm not joking. Like I was sharing bed, like I was sharing my bed uh, in my apartment with like a bunch of other actresses during the shoot. Like, you know, I mean, it was the craziest thing I think I've ever done. I mean, honestly, but it was so fun. And it's, it's it, we, we ended up because we cast uh, a bunch of stand up comedians. And so I went all over San Diego and I went to all of the stand up you know, shows. And I went in there to source actors. And of course, you know, what's the best way to chat to an actor and talk about additions in the project? Well, you put your hand up at the end of the show because they always have the piece where they take folks from the audience. So here I am like, no, pick me. I'd have to go up and do some kind of stand-up shit just so I could get backstage and speak to the actors to try and get them in our show. So I've done lots of crazy stuff like that before. Do you know what I mean? Um, What are you afraid of? Um... You just seem so ballsy. <laughs> I'm, I'm super ballsy. Not being liked. Okay. Yeah, definitely not being liked. Um, I really, I hate people to think I'm a bad person. Mm. You know, because I really, my, I've grown up so, so driven that I can be quite selfish. And that's my worst fear, that people view me as just a selfish kind of person that doesn't care about anyone else. Um, so that's my biggest fear, that I'm viewed like that. I think we all have that, you know, like I have the need to please. My wife was telling me last night we were out for a walk and I grew up in a household where it's kind of like everyone does everything for themselves. Um, And I don't think that was the case, but that's what it felt like. So with my kids, I got four kids. Like I just, if I can do something for them, I want to, right? If I can slightly cater, cater their meal for them. So, so I end up making like five different meals and stuff. But it's like, if I'm going to put the effort into making something, I want you to enjoy it and, and things like that. And so my wife's like, man, you just, you just do way too much because you just want everyone to be happy all the time. And it's like, well, it's so uncomfortable 
when they're not happy all the time or saying no to people. And my young, my youngest son is so competitive and so driven. And I'm curious what advice you might have for someone younger that way, because what I see, I'm not that competitive and I'm not that driven. And I look at him and I go, man, I wish I was that competitive and driven. But it's really hard for him to make friends. You know, he's, uh, <laughs> he gets really angry if he loses. Uh, he gets really bothered and he's like, has a short fuse on stuff. So I see some of the downsides to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, but all I also see is like, man, I wish I was that competitive and driven because you guys will run through brick walls. So I, I'll be like, eh, I don't think so. I know. It, it, I think um, our biggest strengths can become our biggest weaknesses. So I think just um, finding a way to um, be kinder to yourself, um, finding ways to laugh more and engage with life more. So any ways that you can do that with your son where it's just like kind of silly and stupid, that's where the art piece comes in, right? Uh, in many ways, like just, yeah, enjoying the irreverence of it and the fun of it without always having to be so goal driven. Um, mindfulness is a huge piece, I would say, in my athletic career, certainly early on with a success. It was always about, oh my God, what's next? You know, like I've got to keep proving myself, I've got to, and the expectation. So finding a way to sort of rejoice and enjoy in the things that you are doing well in. Um, and then I'd say that for me, like always a way to center myself is to have to do some something for someone else. And so like I was brought up in a household where we had to do chores, where we had to help, where, you know, we were always doing things. My dad did a lot of charity work and, you know, I always try and reset myself and think about how today, how can I just phone someone and ask how they are? So look What's the last thing you did for someone else. Yeah, I think it was, um, I sent a friend just a bunch of flowers to say thank you. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, just like, so yeah, nice. thank you so much, you know. Just saying thank you and, and making someone feel special about who they are, you know, because I think it's easy just to take all of that stuff for granted, isn't it? Um, and for me, again, like we just had a, an amazing holiday with all my nieces and nephews um, back in Scotland. And really spending the time, like just to kind of play and have a laugh. I'm not good at that. I am not good at it because I'm so goal driven. And just being like, you know what? Like just fucking kick around a ball, have a laugh. Like it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to strong arm the nine year old and push them out of the way. <laughs> oh my God. I know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I, by your reaction, I'm saying I'm judging that as actually what happened. <laughs> the good news is, is one of my nieces, Zoe, is like she's uh, now doing judo for Scotland. She's also a rugby player and she's like way stronger than me. So she'll get me in the headlock and drop me to the ground. And it's pretty funny. And so now that you and your and your, your production company and, and everyone attached to the project all quiet on the Western Front, has had the successes it has. Do people treat you differently now? Yes. Which is yeah. so bizarre. Better or worse? Or, or just weird? No, definitely better. Like, folks will... Oh, better. <laughs> okay. I was thought you were going to be like, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> no, it's honestly, it's absolute fucking amazing. <laughs> I know. You're like, like so many times, my husband and I, Simon and I, we're just like, we feel so grateful and so lucky to have been propelled into the stratosphere because we haven't changed. People just want to listen to us now. And all of a sudden you have cache and that gives you a certain confidence as well to like really invest in, you know what? I'm good at this. Like I'm going to take a, a hit at this. And so it's like the snowball, isn't it? You know? Um, so yeah, it's really exciting times to be honest. Um, where we've been able to have great meetings, great conversations. We have lots of great projects that we're developing. It's cool. It's really cool. And do you think that, like, are you just kind of like the hot one right now because there's magic and you got juice around you guys? Or do you recognize that this is like you have a little window of time? Because I've heard, um, I remember Edward Burns. I don't know if you know Edward Burns, the right director, um, actor. He was in Saving Private Ryan. He's great. Uh, 
Exactly. And he he shot um he shot in the nineties uh this really small independent film I think called The Brothers McMullen. Yes. And um a great film. It did really well. And then when he did his next one, She's the One in 1996, I remember listening to the director's commentary and he had to write the whole thing in a week and a half or two weeks because he knew coming off of a little bit of success, I think, at Sundance with the Brothers McMullen, people would take meetings with him, but they yep. would take like a meeting with him. And he had what right. when people would say, what's next? He'd have to go like, here's the script for my next project. Yes, that's exactly it. And it's like so short lived, though. <laughs> it's like, here well, you go, we'll take your meeting. And then a few years later, they're like, eh, you're not longer hot stuff anymore. Is that like, is it really that cut and dry or not? And not really. Do you know what? Again, this is a relational business. And what we've realized is that we knew that if All Quiet did well, we'd want a couple of scripts, you know, so that people can say, you know what, these guys just aren't one hit wonders. So that was important. So we made sure we had that. Um, and then, you know, as we've taken meetings, I think people are realizing what we have to offer and they're just mega excited to to want to work with us, whether that's now or in the future. Um I'm really good at cultivating those relationships so they become friendships. And, you know, those are the kind of friendships that, you know, it might not be a project now. It might all of a sudden in five years time, they're like, oh, my God, we've got this perfect project for you. And that now, like all of the seeds that I've sown are coming now and they're going to continue coming because I can see the fruits of labor. Um, And it's simple things, you know, and, and I do a lot of stuff as well, like, you know, I luckily, because I have another skill in sport and I'm a coach and, you know, with our book that my husband and I wrote and so on, I have something I can offer people. So whenever, you know, we're having meetings or we develop a friendship with a, an executive or someone big at a company and, you know, often we'll start talking about sport and most people are like, oh, I really want to run this half marathon, but I've got this injury. And I'm like, well, listen, hit me up. I've got all the best people in town. I know how to deal with it. Let's chat it through. And so I just end up helping all these people. I'm like, do you want a schedule? Like, I'll write you a schedule for your half marathon. Like, I trained our director, Ed Berger, for 10K before the production. Um, so it's like, do you know what I mean? Like, you just help people. Yeah, I'm like, hey, listen, do you want me to read your script? I'll give you feedback. No worries. You know, I've done that so many times. And so people then, you develop a trust. And then they want to work with you. Um, and then, you know, it's just timing for everything, isn't it? You know, if you just have a good idea at the right time that fits that company. Um, and even if it doesn't fit that company, there will be a company out there that it will fit. So I think, do you know what I mean? It's just like, you're just going to have so, so many seeds. And they'll just, and, and we're very productive. So I know we'll just keep doing stuff. And that keeps you current. While you're busy focusing on sowing all those different seeds with all those different things, how do you know... You know, like I like the, I always remind myself, keep the main thing because I get distracted so quickly. And so while you're busy doing all of these different things, how do you know which one is the right one to be pushing forward at any given time? I think you can tell when it's getting traction. So certainly, you know, when we've got money to write a script, that's going to be our focus, right? So, so you follow momentum, right? Just so put we, everything out there. The thing that starts to get momentum, focus on correct. that. Correct. And I kind of have my running list of things to do, people to connect with, folks I need to have a meeting with or push a script with or talk to finance about or all the different strategies about how different projects might come together. Um, and then luckily, because there's two of us, right, I'm working with my husband and we write together. The way that we write together is really quite unique. We don't have overlapping skills. I'm very much story architecture, the big beats of the story. I'll outline the scenes, then I'll give it to him. He'll write a scene, he'll give it back to me. So in, in many senses, I can jump in and out and keep it macro. He's very much in the weeds, like down in the basement, you know, and so that works quite well because I'm the strategist, I'm the producer, I'm the one that's kind of, how can this all work? What's the mark going on in the marketplace? And then I'm also the one that's high level story structure and character development um, and concepts. And he's spending the hours and hours in the basement writing. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of, do you know what I mean? It's like, and, and it's perfect because he loves that and I hate that. So, and he hates the stuff I do. So it's like happy days, you know? And so... You know, if I were to, if I were to just put my super judgmental outsiders glasses on for a second, 
I go, wow. I mean, I tried to look up, you know, like the family you grew up in and how much wealth you may have come from or whatever, but it's like, okay, she gets to go and become a professional athlete. Okay, she marries a doctor. Okay, she moves to California. And then she makes a film. <laughs> like, like if those are the beats of your life, it looks like you were able to do this because you come from a lot of money or something. Is that the case? Is that not the case? Oh, How hard has this actually been? Yeah, really fucking brutal. Many <laughs> thousands of dollars of debt on the credit card. So my family, um, you know, my parents didn't have much money at the beginning. They were both from very you know, modest means. Um, and there's four of us. And, you know, my mum would hand sew our clothes and all that kind of stuff. And then my dad's job got better. They had a bit more money by the time I came along. So, but the huge thing about my parents was unconditional love. They were dedicated to us as people and as children. So what they taught us about to interact with the world, what was important, the sort of moral standard of life was massive. Um, and that to me is the privilege because not many people have that. And I am acutely aware of that. And I talk about it a lot. So I really think about what's made me who I am. And so I feel very lucky. I'm very close to my family, right? But it was not easy. My parents were divorced when I was 12. I was the last child that was left. It was a really challenging time. Um, I had an eating disorder. I've had all sorts of like weird, horrible things go on in my life. Um, when I met my husband, Simon, he was just finishing up his PhD. He had no money because when you're in university, you don't have any money. He'd been lucky enough to... Uh, he had been lucky enough to uh, get grants all along. Uh, he had applied for monies because he didn't come from a family of money. So he had gotten through all of his degrees, not getting any debt, which was incredible. And then he got offered this job in San Diego. And we went out with uh, with two suitcases and nothing, nothing. Nowhere to stay, no car, using bikes. And I was only 21, married, you know. And when you're a professor in San Diego, you're not paid very much. You know, it was a bit like a paycheck. Oh, my God. And I couldn't work. So I, you know, I've had many odd jobs along the way, but I got a, I was allowed to work on campus. So my first job was behind the ticket desk uh, at the theatre, which was hilarious. The Scottish lassie trying to communicate with a bunch of Americans and selling them tickets. So I would imagine most people went to like a show that they didn't actually want to go to because I got it wrong. But um, anyway, so and I've done countless odd jobs along the way, all sorts of, you know, cleaning toilets and working in bike shops and working in yogurt shops and, you know, all sorts of crap. Uh, starting my own business, doing loads of free work first. So we've gone through many phases of just having no money. During COVID was awful. We had a coaching business. We lost most of it. We had to sell everything in our house to just pay our bills. Um, and you what's know, interesting all- about this, though, th- this is when you're in pre-production or, yeah. or for, yep. for your future sure. film. And we ha- didn't have the money yet. This was right at the turning point where Netflix had said they want to do it, but they hadn't greenlit it because of COVID. So we were like selling, I was selling all of my bikes uh, so that we could pay our mortgage. Uh, so I sold his motorbike. We're just going through our garage trying to sell everything because we didn't have any money coming in. And then Netflix greenlit it, which was amazing. And it saved... Myself, my writing partner, he didn't have any money either. He was living with us. We were all like living together just so that we could get by. And then you're paid this money, right? And it's really all things relatively. It's not that much. (laughs) And, you know, and shit, over the last few months, you know, we haven't had any money coming in either. And we're living in a small one-bedroom apartment. We've got lots of amazing things ahead. But, you know... And that's a huge reason why writers are striking, right? Everyone's like, oh my God, you must be so rich now. And I'm like, no, (laughs) I think we will be. We've got masses of potential and loads of things on the horizon. But, you know, writers are ultimately treated like shit. (laughs) And they're not regarded for what they do. They're not often given bonuses for what they do. They're not put on any pedestal for what they've done. Um... And all quiet was a challenging experience. We were really cast aside for a lot of it. 
until later down the line when they realized that we were of benefit. Um, which was From a marketing and promotion point of view, you mean? Or? Yes. Yep. Yeah. When, because nobody... cause foreign film, foreign film, foreign director, we need some... I mean, you're Scottish, so not American, but we need some locals to promote this thing. I think it was more to do the fact that, oh my God, there's no women in this production. Oh my God, it's all white males. Oh my God, Leslie actually spent the last 16 years getting this project off the ground. How did we not know this? Oh, she was a professional athlete and a five-time world champion. Oh, you know, so nobody knew my story because nobody cared. And then I had to, luckily, a good friend of mine forked up a bunch of money for me to get my own publicist, get out a couple of stories, which suddenly took off in the UK. And then all of a sudden, Netflix were like, oh, shit, wait a minute, maybe we can use you. And of course, they did. And I fucking went for it and used and did every interview possible, got all of this amazing publicity. And it was like, oh, wow, you're amazing, you know. Anyway, that's a whole other <laughs> fucking podcast. That's what you call the industry and being, you know, taken advantage of. But that's okay. But but you're squeezing it, right? Like you're getting every drop you can out of it once the machine got turned on. Well, you know, and I think as well, like gratitude, right? We had a, our film made, amazing. Yeah, and we managed to work with one of the best authors in the world, Edward Berger. I mean, how fucking lucky is that? Our work was elevated beyond anything. The experiences that we've had are incredible. So as much like negativity as there there might have been in terms of the fact that in many ways we were cast aside, we weren't included the way that we wanted to be purely creatively, and I don't mean financially. Um, At the same time, this has opened so many doors. So you just, you run with it and you say, you know what, the only thing I'm going to take from that is the fact that I'm not going to treat people like that moving forward. You, were you on set watching dailies and things like that? Or were you no. pretty removed from it? We were not allowed because of COVID. Okay, so what uh, was the first cut that you guys ended up seeing? It was pretty pretty well-established cut. Uh, and it was a Christmas um, before, like the previous year before we came out. It yeah, in 21. Been, Christmas 21? Yeah, yeah. What, what was your... Because um, I imagine if it's an early cut, you know, maybe there's no color correction. Maybe the sound mix isn't final. You know, maybe there's missing scenes or pickups that need to be done or whatever. But um, what was your feeling as credits start to roll and you start to watch this cut? Everything from, oh my God, this is amazing. This is to, to They ruined to, that scene! <laughs> no, I, you know what? Nothing like that. Nothing no? about... See, for me, it was purely the heartache of not being involved, of not being involved in terms of the production. And it didn't, I don't think it needed to be that way. Uh, they could have tried harder to include us, but unfortunately, they didn't bother. Because again, they didn't really care. They got what they wanted. And, you know, all we ever wanted was to learn and grow creatively from this experience. And you hope that people that are of an elevated status will help you in that regard, will mentor you in that regard, but many people won't and they won't bother. So um, that was a heartache to see these beautiful actors, these beautiful scenes. And then, of course, during award season to meet all of the heads of department and all of the intellect and, and creative intensity that they all brought to the table. That's what I love. That's what I do this for. And, you know, um, yeah, I just wish we could have been a part of it, but that's okay. You know, I've learned a shit ton from this journey. Again, feel very lucky. And I'm just going to take all of what I've learned and take the positivity out of it and put it to the next projects. Now, I um, have had... all so So in high school, I remember watching something all quiet on the Western Front. And I guess it was like the 70s, the 1970s television yep. movie or something. I remember it's something where at the end, there's some birds he's looking at. Um, yeah. So I don't know which one that was, but I saw that and then I kind of knew about it, but it was on my Netflix queue for a long time. But honestly, I just, I never found myself like, I can't wait to watch this <laughs> fun, exciting, uplifting movie. Uh, and I had to watch it in parts. I found it... Unbearably uncomfortable to watch. Um, And from the very first opening scenes, you know, through the whole sequence where it hit me like we are watching, 
I think it was when the first note of the soundtrack came in of that drone of like the industrial oh. complex, the machine, the war machine and watching the laundry, like the first few shots, it's hitting me where I'm like, this is not going to okay, be, easy. we are not in like, like it, this is not the type of movie I normally enjoy. And I think I had to watch in like 20 or 25 minute segments because it was yeah. just too heavy for me. It is a heavy movie. There's no doubt about it. But I think like when you consider what he achieved in terms of that emotionality, um, it's so clever and groundbreaking. And I think that it's a message that needed to be told and told from a different perspective. There's so many reasons why. Um, but yeah, it's not a bloody easy movie to watch. I'll give you that. You know, at the premiere in Toronto, when the film finished, you know, you're always hoping, hey, I hope I'm on that film that, you know, is on Hollywood Reporter the next day. Is there was a 10 minute standing ovation. And you're like, woo. There's Back probably just silence. Silence. Nobody said anything. I'm like, oh my God, they hated it. It was mm. really hard. And afterwards, I was like, oh my, did anyone like it? Like, what the hell? So it was tough. It was tough. But, you know, it's, yeah, we feel really proud of it. Really proud of it. Well, and such, so such, um, I mean, this is part script, this is part producing, this is part of the director and the, and the whole production team and post-production. And I've been close enough to production to realize just like how many people are involved. Um, but the juxtaposition between, you know, shots of sunlight coming through forested trees of beauty with knowing just, you know, feet away or yards away is this mayhem of war, um, you know, I have to ask you, like, I struggle with anyone who says that things are worse today than they used to be. Because my grandfather's 95. He was born in 1928. He came to Germany because he was in Lithuania. He came to Germany um, during the Second World War as a refugee. And my dad's from Berlin. And like, my whole family was German and stuff like that. But um, not German versus allies or any of that stuff. But it's just like, I, I always turn to my grandfather, who's still alive at 95. And I go, I don't understand how anyone can think that the world is worse off today than it used to be. Like, like it's just, if anyone knows anything about the Civil War or about about um, World War One or World War Two or, uh, you know, how small, you know, polio affected people. It's like, I just, I don't understand how anyone can think we're worse off today than we used to be. Do you, having these experiences and producing this film, do you, you must feel the same way as me, right? Yeah, do you know what? I think it's just different, isn't it? I think that the issues that we're dealing with, I don't know that you can put a value to, is it worse, is it better? Because I think that in today's society, and you can see it with the polarization of belief systems and the intense anger that people are experiencing, there's a lot of uncertainty about the way the world is going. Um, and that's everything from whether that's climate change to the economy to AI, all of these things. There's a, a deep sense of fear that maybe is different from that period of time. Now, you know, do we have more at our disposal now? Yes, you know, we have, there's certainly more wealth, but at the same time, there's more disparity. So again, I think it's like comparing apples and oranges, really. So not better, not worse, just completely different. Completely different, yeah. So um, it's, yeah, completely different, completely different. But that's what I love to dig into in stories is what's going on in our world nowadays? You know, what's going on in the past? How does it mirror what we're experiencing right now? What can we learn from the past? There's so many things to look into because it's cyclical, isn't it? The world is cyclical in terms of the issues that we deal with. Um, but there's no doubt that we're going through a phase right now of real existential crises. People are lacking purpose and meaning in their lives. Um, and that's brought about by deep uncertainty, I think. I had Robert McKee on the podcast. I don't know if you know him. He runs oh my God. a, a script You're writing. I would have been nervous about doing that podcast. <laughs> Well, uh, well, I had him on. It was amazing. But I asked him towards the end of the podcast, hey, you know, at your age, uh, you know, you were trained and grew up in a world that you could never have possibly imagined existed. Like you would never have been able to train for it or prepare for it. So for people who are coming to age now, what advice would you have for them? And his number one piece of advice was learn history. Yeah. He said, learn 
history. It's all happened before. It's all cyclical. Right? You need to understand the history. And I've spent the last year reading biographies about the founding fathers and about mm -hmm. um, the Civil War. And um, uh, and so, again, like when it came to your film, I was like, I'm ready. Okay, I'm ready to do this. It was just like, whew. Well, I think but, as well, like as a, a storyteller, right? Like, you know, research is one of the key components of how we dig into story, whatever it is that we're doing. And whether it's a current story or a historical story, it doesn't matter. The research open up, opens up your world to so many different ideas and concepts. And, and that's how we did this adaptation for All Quiet. It's like, okay, how do you take a book like All Quiet, which is like excerpts of a diary with no real through line, and how do you elevate it, make it you know, cinematically appealing to a modern audience. And that's where we dug into this research and we find this historical context of the armistice being signed, the last six hours of the clock, uh, it's the last six hours of the war being like a ticking clock uh, to give it some kind of dramatic propulsion. But most importantly, seeing it from the other side and what we are not taught about, you know, what happens if you crush your enemy? Well, World War I led to World War II. We're not taught that. And yet, you know, what's going on now, surely that can teach us something about how to treat our enemies as we move forward and what the consequences might be. So with All Quiet, you had 16 years to get ready for this. And now you're working on kind of your sophomore attempt. I have to ask, like, what are you worried about? What are you nervous about? Uh, you know, because the greatest bands in the world put out the greatest first record. And then the second one is just, oh, there's so much pressure. It's the worst. So what are you hoping to do differently this time? And what are you doing to make sure you don't freak out and mess it up? Um, you know... That's a great question. And I think my experience with sport has taught me that the beauty is in trying to master the craft, regardless of the outcome. So I'm not actually worried about what that outcome is. I'm so joyous that I even have the opportunity to do what I'm doing, right? So for Simon and I, it really is about delving in, working hard, facing our fears, mastering our craft, learning as much as we can, uh, working with as many different people, collaborating, growing, um, all of those things. And yeah, do we sit there and go, fucking hell, I don't know if we can do this. Absolutely. You know, but like, how cool to be doing it? And that's kind of my mindset, you know, and you just kind of got to be like that. And I've learned that through sport, like, so many times like the gratitude piece I mean I literally went from the best in the world to suffering from Lyme's disease and being bedridden for a year and thinking I don't know if I'll ever be able to do this again so you know I look at you know the film world I look at the TV world I look at all these other writers that don't have the opportunities I do and I'm like man I'd rather be sucking and fail and have the opportunity than be on the outside <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I think that's advice we can all uh, we can all take to heart. You know, the last question I was going to ask you is about transferable skills, but between being an athlete and and moving into the next thing, but you've already laid it out. So you seem like the type of person who would be successful at no matter what you attack or what you choose to put your passion behind. And is that unique to you, or? Have you figured out something that a lot of us struggle with? Because I feel like I could drop you in any situation and eventually you'll figure it out and crush it. So are you just kind of unique that way or can we all learn this thing? You know, I think you can definitely learn it. Um, and in fact, my husband and I have written a book called The Brave Athletes, Calm the F Down and Rise to the Occasion, which definitely has some good tools in there, right? It's not just about sport. Um, it's about understanding how our brain brains work, right? And that there's a fight that goes on in our brain. You know, all of those dark thoughts, all of those things that we don't want to think and feel, but there's ways to kind of master it. And your brain is plastic, meaning that it can change. It's neuroplasticity. So you can rewire it. And that's what I've spent a life doing is creating resiliency. And you cannot learn it. You have to earn it, which means you have to get in the trenches, right? You have to do shit that hurts, that doesn't work out. Because that is, it's, it's, we call it in sport, the overload principle. 
you know, you push at the hard stuff, you recover, and then your body gets stronger as a consequence. It's the same with your brain. So, you know, I've just created these neural networks in my brain through years of sport and years of being told I can't do it, years of overcoming failure, dealing with failure, finding ways to be positive about it, grow and learn from it and move forward. So that's one piece of it. And then I just think it's just, maybe it's the Scottish humbleness in me. Just that, do you know what I mean? But just that piece of like, you're always brought down to earth when you go back to Scotland, like who the fuck are you know? And so, yeah, I think you just they, have they that. They use more kind of, choice words than that as well. I want to know how different the C word can be taken in America versus oh, Scotland. I mean. Oh, it's like it's used every, every other word. Do you know what I mean? It's like a term of endearment. That's the joke of it all. Um, but yeah, I think it's just like, I think if you if you always keep your ego in check, which being Scottish is pretty easy to do. You're growing up, that's in your DNA, right? You're never going to be, you know, talking yourself up too much. But if you always keep your ego in check, then, you know, you're gracious about where you're going and who you're working with and what you need to learn. I mean, I'm always learning. I'm always messing things up. That's kind of the beauty of it. And I think if you could admit that and say, you know what, like, I don't know how to do this. I didn't do this well. Or you're just always self-assessing. And I've got a husband who's a psychologist, which is amazing. So, you know, we kind of help each other do that. (laughs) Amazing. Or you're like, I just need help. Stop (laughs) turning everything into a thing. No? Well, hey, here's the thing. And most partners will say this about their partner. They might be filled with great advice, but they never bloody do it themselves, you know? <laughs> so My wife yesterday told me to stop giving her advice. <laughs> like she just came straight out and said, like, listen, I don't listen to any of your advice. It may work for fine. you. It's not for me. Stop it, please. And I was like, oh, we've been together 23 years. Thanks for telling me this now. <laughs> Anyway. Oh my God, right? Well, some people just want to be heard. They don't want the solution, right? And that's, and again, that's understanding the brain. Some people think in different ways. They don't want the solution. They just want to be heard, you know, and that's, uh, you know, a, a specific piece of it all. But yeah, interesting world we live in, that's for sure, eh? Well, Leslie Patterson, I have one final question for you. But before I get to that, I want to quickly ask, what's the best place for people to follow up with you, uh, get your book, learn about the coaching, things like that? Yeah, you can certainly go to our not very updated website, <laughs> braveheartcoach.com. Um, but I'm sure we'll have other stuff in the future. You know, I'm on IMDb, I'm on Insta, Leslie does try, T-R-I-E. Um, you can reach out through there. You know, my email address is on the on the website. So, yeah. You through calls. the coaching, you give people their freedom, right? <laughs> or is that a bad joke? Right. <laughs> It's not. I swear to God, that's part of our philosophy, right? Freedom to fail. That's the beauty of it. Freedom to fail. I love it. So for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Um, Seeing something that matters. I want to have an impact on people that films have had an impact on me or stories have had an impact on me as I was growing up, right? I want to do the same with other people. I want to see something that matters. I want to change the world in some small way. 